On July 31, 1944, in London, three Polish generals made a decision that had tragic consequences. The commander of the Home Army, Tadeusz Komarowski, and his deputy, Leopold Okulicki, decided the next day at 17 o'clock to start an uprising in Warsaw against the German occupation forces. Literally an hour before the fateful decision was made, a message was received that the first Soviet tanks appeared on the banks of the Vistula. When it became known that these tanks were still German, the military leaders did not change their plans. They hastened to proclaim the authority of the Polish government in exile in Warsaw before the Red Army entered the capital. This event will be known as the Warsaw Uprising. All in game. During the summer offensive, the Red Army defeated the German Army Group Center and liberated the Belarusian SSR and the eastern regions of Poland. On July 21, the Polish Committee of National Liberation, PKNO, was established in Moscow. He issued a manifesto that called for the fight against the Nazis, support for the People's Army and the Red Army. Among other things, the document proclaimed friendly relations between Poland and the USSR. The members of the committee intended to carry out political and land reforms, to transfer factories, banks and industrial enterprises to the state, and to give workers political rights. The uprising was planned to take place at the final stage of the war. The command of the Home Army had been preparing it for several years. The rebels were supposed to hit the retreating Wehrmacht in the back, which at that time would be occupied by units of the Red Army breaking through its defenses. When the Soviet troops approached Warsaw, they would be met by the full-fledged owners of the capital, units of the Home Army, with whom the Reds would have to be reckoned with as legitimate authorities. As a result of the operation, called the Tempest. At the conference of the Big Three, the USSR, the USA, and Great Britain, in Tigran in December 1943, the Polish question was also raised. The liberation of Poland fell on the shoulders of the Soviet troops. At the same time, Polish politicians in London hoped to win the support of the British government in the upcoming negotiations with the USSR regarding the future of Poland. This plan was like a sandcastle. No army would tolerate combat formations in its rear that were not bound to it by allied trees. The Red Army disarmed all units of the Krajowa Army that were in the territory it had liberated and did not want to join the first army of the Polish army. Many officers and soldiers of these formations ended up in Soviet internment camps. Improvisation without coordination. When deciding to start an uprising, the Polish government and the government made several mistakes in assessing the current situation. Despite the success of the summer offensive, the Red Army experienced tangible difficulties. Its communications were stretched out, there was not enough fuel and ammunition, and the troops needed to be replenished before the attack on Warsaw. The Battle of Radzimin east of Warsaw, July 25, August 5, was the largest tank battle of the Second World War on Polish territory. 500 tanks participated in it from the German side, 400 from the Soviet side. Tank Corps of the Red Army. The Red Army went on the defensive. The Soviet strategy did not provide for a direct attack on Warsaw, but the encirclement of the city. The Wehrmacht understood this, but the command of the Home Army did not. The quick liberation of France and the assassination attempt on Hitler were misinterpreted by the Home Army command as corruption in the ranks of the Wehrmacht. Home Army by August 1 had too few people and weapons. In total, there were about 30,000 fighters in its ranks, of which only about 3,000 people were armed and very few had combat experience. Ammunition was enough for two or three days. On July 7, the Allied Chiefs of Staff announced that they would not be able to supply the required number of weapons. They also demanded that the Polish government in exile coordinate the date of the uprising with the Red Army. The Poles ignored the demand. On July 27, the Polish government in exile in London formally asked the British for air support for the uprising, but was refused. The Beginning of the Uprising According to the plan, the rebels were supposed to capture the airfields in Okents and Bilani in the vicinity of Warsaw, interrupt traffic at the railway junction of the capital, and capture the radio station. In fact, the implementation of the plan fell on the shoulders of the Warsaw Command of the Home Army. The uprising lasted nine weeks, 
but the Home Army did not conduct combat operations in other German-occupied areas in order to alleviate the situation in Warsaw. Formations from other regions were not sent to the capital. The small contingents of the Army of the People, who were in Warsaw, joined the uprising and passed into the hands of the Warsaw Command of the Home Army, while remaining politically independent from it. The Germans, who knew about the preparations for the uprising and the date of its beginning, built protective fortifications near bridges and important buildings. By 13 o'clock on August 1, the troops were put on alert. However, the German command underestimated the scope of the performance, and there were only about 12,000 Wehrmacht, SS, and police soldiers in the city. On the first day, the rebels attacked almost all German strongholds. On the night of August 1-2, the Germans received fresh reinforcements, but the Home Army still managed to liberate Zolobors, Mokoto, and some other areas of the city. On the streets controlled by the Home Army, the soldiers erected barricades, which did not allow the Wehrmacht to use tanks, and therefore the battles took place in houses, apartments, and basements. The onslaught of the rebels, albeit worse armed, made an impression on the German troops. Without a bridge, all four bridges over the Vistula, both airfields, the barracks of the Wehrmacht, the SS, and the police, as well as more than a hundred administrative buildings, remained in the hands of the invaders. The Germans managed to isolate the Poles from each other, and in different parts of the city, rebel detachments fought the enemy on their own. The invaders retained telephone and telegraph communications, and also controlled the most important roads, and therefore the supply of troops on the Eastern Front was not interrupted. On August 3, the rebels, saving ammunition, went on the defensive. The initiative was in the hands of the invaders. The Nazi command perceived the uprising as a convenient and long-awaited reason to strike at the Poles. At the beginning of the month, Hitler signed an order that provided for the complete destruction of the city and its population, and also forbade the taking of prisoners. As a warning to others, Warsaw was to be razed to the ground. Speaking to the generals on September 21, 1944, Himmler noted that the Germans needed to eliminate the flower of the Polish nation, which had been blocking Germany's path to the east for 700 years. On August 5, German troops under the command of SS Gruppenführer Erich von dem Batch moved to systematic attacks on the areas occupied by the rebels. At first, von dem Back had only 2,740 SS and police fighters at his disposal. However, reinforcements came regularly. With the infamous SS unit of Oskar Derlwanger, he received 880 people from the 29th Waffen-Grenadier Division of the SS Russian Liberation People's Army collaborator Bronislav Kaminsky, 1,700 people. Also arrived were 2,500 people from the SS penal camp in Danzig and the 608th Regiment of Azerbaijani and Turkmen soldiers of the Wehrmacht. By August 20, von Dembach had gathered 21,000 men, well armed, with powerful artillery, guns and mortars, tanks and assault self-propelled guns. German troops isolated certain areas of the city and destroyed the rebels there. In the center of Warsaw, in the Old Town, about 7,200 fighters of the Home Army, until September 2, defended themselves against twice the enemy. The Germans did not spare Warsaw. Heavy artillery fire and bombing destroyed the city and killed many civilians. The prisoners were to be shot. The Germans used Polish women as human shields. On August 4 and 5, Units under the command of Lieutenant General Heinz Reinfart entered Warsaw from the west. In those two days alone, they massacred 38,000 citizens. However, soon Erich von Dembach ordered the extermination of the Poles to be stopped, since the cruelty of the Estes did not at all suppress their desire for resistance. Bach decided to change tactics. In the event of surrender, he promised the rebels the status of prisoners of war. Crisis and Surrender Having defeated the rebels in the Old City, Bax sent troops to the eastern districts of Warsaw. By September 6, the Germans had established control over almost the entire western bank of the Vistula and began building fortifications there to defend against the Red Army. In early September, the position of the rebels became more complicated. 
artillery shelling and bombing claimed the lives of many citizens. Increasingly, there was a shortage of weapons, ammunition, medicines, water, and food. But worst of all was that the rebels were losing faith in victory. With each lost district of the city, the rebels' enthusiasm waned more and more, and they had less and less confidence in the command of the home army. Meanwhile, the German troops withdrawn from the front, who had combat experience, cleared the city from the rebels. On September 30, having lost the most important areas of Warsaw, the AK command began negotiations on surrender. They ended on October 2 to 900 officers and 15,000 AK soldiers surrendered to German captivity. The city was destroyed by 80%. Two sides of the coin. The Warsaw Uprising still causes conflicting feelings. After five years of terror, murder, and violence, the Poles finally had a chance to face the invaders in open battle. Although the rebels experienced a shortage of weapons and ammunition, their courage and readiness for self-sacrifice made it possible to beat the occupiers well. Only after nine weeks of fierce fighting did the Germans break the resistance of the Poles. According to Himmler, each of the 63 days of the uprising cost the German army 300 soldiers killed. To suppress it, 25,000 well-armed fighters had to be pulled into the city. The Germans themselves admitted that the Poles fought heroically. The rebels lost 16,000 killed and another 6,000 wounded. About 200,000 ordinary citizens became victims of fighting and bombing. The German side lost 17,000 soldiers dead and missing. 9,000 Germans were injured. Warsaw was destroyed and plundered. Historical monuments lay in ruins. Be that as it may, it was the struggle of the Polish people against the invaders. It was attended not only by the soldiers of the home army, but also by other military formations, as well as almost the entire civilian population. The two month long battles in Warsaw were the Poles' contribution to the victory over Germany and marked the culmination of six years of Polish resistance.